Would you sing as you worship together this morning? Come on, as we worship together in this place, we're going to call upon the name of the Lord. There's no one more worthy of our praise today. Come on, wherever you are today, let's sing this out together. We need no other hiding place. name this we know this we know promise never to forsake but you begin you will sustain
Come on, church, just give him a hand, clap and praise today. He is worthy. You may be seated. Well, amen. It's so good to see you guys this morning on property and grateful for those that are joining us online. Uh, hey, I want to remind you of a couple of things I'm going to pray for us and we'll continue to worship this morning. Uh, first of all, I want to remind you that this morning we are starting back uh, our life groups. I noticed there's already people over there this morning in our nine o'clock life groups. And then when you leave this morning, as you exit the auditorium, uh, you can move your way right over uh, and pick out a life group. Uh, and really, you can begin the process of trying uh, several several life groups, trying to find a place where you can connect with some other people, uh, but also develop and learn and grow in your faith. And so uh, as you leave this morning out of the Connect Center, you'll notice the guide that is out there shows you all the classes, uh, particularly for you, uh, that are offered at 1030, that that would be you could worship here, uh, move your way right over there. And I do want to remind you, for those of you with children, there is a change up in what your children experience. Uh, if you're if they're back there right now at nine o'clock, uh, when 1030, rolls around, it's a completely different experience for them. So you're not leaving them just in a repeated uh, kind of uh, situation or service. I want to make sure you guys are aware of that. Uh, but be sure to check that out. It is a great way, uh, number one, to connect, but really in a major way uh, to develop, to learn, and to grow in your faith. So that's out there at the Connect Center. Uh, you can know exactly where you can connect, try a couple of different things, but make sure you do that. Then I want to celebrate one thing. I mentioned it last week. I want to continue to celebrate and try to keep it uh, in front of you. Uh, but we baptized again this past week. And so we're praising God for that, plan to baptize in the days ahead. Amen. Uh, so, so grateful that people are getting saved, follow through believers baptism. It's a big deal with just all the change and craziness that's going on. And then I want to commend you as a church. Uh, I want to thank each and every one of you uh, that have either invested uh, in our Night to Shine that happens this coming Friday night, uh, or for those of you that have signed up to serve uh, this upcoming Friday night. Uh, this coming Friday, uh, we got a special night for special needs, and we're going to be serving uh, over a hundred different people with special needs. Uh, this upcoming Friday night. And that does not necessarily count uh, the family members, all those that are connected that we're going to be serving this Friday night. So I want to thank you for your investment in the ministry that allows us to do this, allows us to make a difference. And again, I want to thank all of you. You know, right now, I am especially, I'm always grateful for our volunteers, but I'm telling you, it is exponential right now. Uh, here we are in the middle of a pandemic and a lot of questions about what's going on with COVID, all that kind of stuff. And our church is so blessed. And I hope you think about this. Uh, we are still manning, greeting people, uh, worship host, all that for three services. Uh, we are covering uh, all of our preschool, all of our children for three services. I know a lot of churches, those children's areas are not open, all those kind of things, because they don't have the people that can serve, that can keep those things happening. But here at Liberty, all of our greeters in place, all of our children's workers, preschool workers, uh, we continue to move forward with our not to shine, all of those kinds of things, uh, because of the people that are willing to come out in the middle of this and serve you, serve me, serve our community. So can we give it up for all of those volunteers? Amen. And I want to stress again, I just hope you notice that when you walk through here, it is not a small thing uh, that we do three services every single Sunday and rotate people through here like we do. It's an amazing thing, and it really shows the heart of this church and how people are willing to serve and willing to make an investment. Now you got your life group teachers preparing over there every week ready to teach. So it's an amazing thing, it's a special place, guys, I'm just telling you, uh, and people willing to do that, willing to kind of you know go through this uh, and do the best we can in the midst of it. Uh, I'm honored uh, to be the pastor and great for how you guys serve in a major, major way. Hey, I want to I want to kind of prep you for something, all right? And then I'll lead us in a time of prayer. Next Sunday is going to be a great Sunday at Liberty. Next Sunday, Valentine's Day uh, falls uh, on Sunday. So I'm going to talk to you about relationships. Somebody say, help me, Jesus, all right? Uh, I'm going to talk to you about relationships next week. We're going to do some serious, now listen to me, some serious giveaways for some great dates, all right? So we're going to be doing Doing that, uh, you'll be able to kind of be involved in that drawing, all that. We got a great uh, kind of uh, some great gifts for you guys, and we're going to do that at every single service. So it's not going to be just one gift uh, that's given out over three. We're going to do specific stuff for one, specific stuff for the next, for all three services, and then we're going to have a gift for everybody. And all I can say it involves food. And if you're like me, you can always praise Jesus, right? Uh, when there's some food, and listen, free. Come on now. 
help me, right? Free. So we got some great things happening next Sunday for Valentine's Day. You don't want to miss it. So uh, grab that special someone or find a special someone this week and bring them, amen, uh, Sunday. And it's going to be a great time. What better way to start a relationship than under a lesson on relationships uh, next Sunday morning? So make sure you do that, all right? Hey, let me pray for us. Uh, we're going to continue to worship. I remind you, uh, whether you're online or in the building, uh, that uh, of the ways that you can give. If you're going to be giving this morning on property, as you leave, you'll notice the generosity boxes in the hallway, also in the commons area. So if you're giving on property, that's where you would put your gift. But also on the screen, you notice other ways you can continue to invest. And I can't say enough, cannot say enough about the generosity of this church. And so, so grateful for you guys. Uh, as I pray, let me let you guys in on something. For the last five years, we've used Super Bowl Sunday in a special way at our church. So this Sunday, Super Bowl Sunday. I don't give a rip about the football game, but I'm excited about the food and the wings. Amen. That's all I'm going to say. Uh, so I am excited about that part of it. But we've used it as kind of an in-house time uh, to focus on what we're about. Uh, Super Bowl is all about achievement and these two teams doing great things to end up in this position. And we've used that representation in our church of who we need to be and what we need to be doing. And so that's going to be the focus of what I'm teaching this morning. So excited about that. So let's pray and uh, we'll continue to worship. Father, so grateful for what you're doing in our church. God, uh, really and truly, I am so grateful. And I pray your strongest and greatest blessings upon those that serve within this church. This band is given it, Lord, all through this. They've shown up, been a part of what you're doing. Uh, all of our volunteers in every single area and capacity. Uh, God, it really is amazing uh, to watch as they rise up and continue to serve you. And that's who they're serving, Lord. Serve you during this time and making a difference, Lord. Seeing people saved, seeing people baptized, uh, seeing people continue to grow in their faith. And uh, God, strengthen us in who we need to be. And so we praise you for that and pray you continue to do great things in in us and around us in the days ahead. And Father, we do pray that you would continue to allow our influence for you to grow in this community as we serve those with special needs, as we serve those that we live near, or God, those that we work with, may you use us for your honor and for your glory. And so bless this time. Speak to hearts as only you can. May you be glorified in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Would you sing as we continue to worship this morning? Creation knows the voice spoken to the void, the breath that brought the dust to life, and sing the stars to fall. The darkness fears you. Drove it back before, and though the night is long, I know your life will drive it back once more. Run away from you, and things say.
strongholds not be moved, will not be silenced, and cower at his roar. And my God is for me, then what am I to fear? And I will not deny
church. We celebrate him in this place today. Let's pray together. Lord God, we are so grateful just to be able to come into your house, God, Lord, just to have this time, just to be able to worship you, Lord, just to be able to praise your name, God. And Lord, we're just so thankful, Lord, that we, Lord, can come into this place, God, Lord, and we can proclaim, Lord, that there is nothing, Lord, nothing that can take away our hallelujah. Lord God, as we just come now into this time in your word, we do ask, Lord, that you would just open up our hearts, open up our minds to what you have in store for us today, God. Lord, again, we love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' precious name that we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Hey, if you got a Bible with you, go to the book of Acts. So you're just in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. You'll run right in uh, to the book of Acts. Go ahead and find your place there. And I remind you, uh, what we've done for the last five years is uh, we've kind of used Super Bowl Sunday uh, to speak to the church, to us as liberty and kind of what God is doing or desiring for us to do. Uh, you know, it's uh, not escaped any of us that we are facing uh, really and truly for our generation unprecedented Days And anytime you go through a very challenging time uh, in your life, there's a question that should always uh, kind of rise to the top. Now, often in challenging days, uh, we don't find it difficult to ask the question, why? Can I get a witness, right? Uh, when we're going through difficulty, hardship, uh, we find ourselves saying, why do I have to go through this? Why uh, am I facing this? But I would challenge you this morning uh, that the Bible speaks more to this question than the why question, and that is, what? Uh, we can spend a lot of our time uh, asking why, but let me help you with a little bit of an understanding. Uh, you are not God, and we are all glad. Amen? Uh, I'm just saying, and I am not God, and you all are glad. So why will take you down a dead-end road, but what can produce something inside of your life? And so often when you go through difficult days, you ought to get to the place or in all situations where you begin to ask the question, what is the way forward? Uh, that can be in a relationship that's gone bad, and you ask yourself, what is the way forward? That can be in finances of, man, uh, maybe a job change or difficulty uh, in spending or whatever it may be. Uh, what is the way forward? And what I want to do this morning is, is in these days, these challenging days, I mean, think about what we're facing. Uh, you still have a large portion of your church uh, worshiping online with you, uh, where you're not even normal, uh, kind of normally interacting like you would. Uh, we don't know what the way... Uh, as far as timing is forward on all that we're experiencing, uh, I hear people saying, when are things going to get back to normal? And we're starting to forget what normal was. It's been so long uh, that we've been inside of this. And so what is the way forward for us as a church? Well, the great thing is the book of Acts in the Bible is the story of the first church. Uh, it started on the day of Pentecost there in Acts chapter 2. And Pentecost just literally means uh, 50. And I'm going to uh, make sense of that in just a minute in where the church began. But as you look through the book of Acts, you discover really and truly uh, some characteristics of the church. And I want to remind everybody in this room that the church was under great persecution in the early days, facing major difficulty, uh, warring really with its culture, uh, warring even with its nation that it was most represented in. Uh, all of those kinds of things, and yet we learn a lot about the church in difficult days from the book of Acts. Now today, listen to me carefully, uh, we have churches on just about every other corner in America. Everybody in this room knows where we live. You can get in a car. You will not go far. Come on, right? Uh, and you will run in to a church. But what I want to do this morning is I want to raise the question of what is the biblical function of the church? I mean, here we are in these days, and we ask the question, what is the way forward. What I want to do is ask it more intentionally to us this morning. What is the way forward for liberty? See, as you look at scripture, and I don't mean this mean or judgmental, but as you look at scripture, you're going to discover how different we are as Christ followers in the 21st century than they were as Christ followers in the first century. And what I want to do this morning is I want to go back and I want to look at what does it really mean to be a believer? What does it really mean to be a Christ follower? And I want you to hear me this morning because I think this is so essential. I really believe that that is something we're going to need to understand more than ever in the culture in which we're living. Uh, I'm just telling you right now, listen to me, uh, as Christ followers, uh, I really believe in the days ahead it's going to be more challenging uh, than it has been in the past for our generation, for the way that we have lived and what we have experienced even here in this nation. And so what I want to do this morning is I want to give you some truths that we need to focus on as liberty, but I want to show you that these truths really are found in Scripture. Uh, they're right out of the book of Acts, right here in Acts chapter 2. And I'm going to be real specific in what does it look like for us 
as we go forward, whether you're online, whether you're in the building, doesn't matter. Uh, what does it look like for us if you call Liberty home or if you're contemplating calling Liberty home, what does it look like? So these points are gonna be very specific to us, although they're really as a whole to the church, but we're gonna make them personal because until you accept responsibility for what God is calling you to do, you will waste your life. Until you accept responsibility for what God is calling you to do in this generation, this time, in your family, in your home, in your city, in your community, then you're really going to waste your life. So let me tell you what the way forward is for us on this Super Sunday so that we can move out and be successful in what God is calling us to do. Number one responsibility that I think we have as a church moving forward is liberty needs to build lives of power through prayer. This is the third week in a row that I have mentioned prayer in our services. And I'm not going to spend any time this morning on the how-to of prayer because we dealt with that last week and you can go online, watch that service for free. So I'm not going to spend any time on the how-to. I'm just going to talk about the importance. One thing I love about the book of Acts, say amen so know you're listening. One thing I love about the book of Acts is they don't just talk about God in the book of Acts. They experience God in the book of Acts. We have so many uh, churches, so many life groups, Sunday school classes, small groups, Bible studies, whatever you want to call them, where they spend so much time talking about God, talking about what God has said, when he said it, how he said it, and what it meant. We have very few people today that are really experiencing God in the fullest capacity of which he desires for them to experience him. This is what makes the church different from every other organization on planet earth. The Bible says that we have a power that the world knows nothing of. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. No other organization in the world has the power of God in it. The only thing that God promised his power to, his spirit to, is the church of Jesus Christ made up of his followers. And if you look at the background of the birth of the church in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, and I do want to remind you, in very difficult days, challenging days, listen to me as I say this to you. If you were a Christ follower in those days, you stood a chance to lose your life not just kind of go through the motions of church and Christ following and all that kind of stuff. And so in Acts chapter one and verse eight, Jesus was speaking. I know I got you in chapter two. That's where we're gonna be. But in Acts chapter one and verse eight, listen to what Jesus said about his church. He said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and as far as the remotest parts of the earth. Jesus said that his Holy Spirit is gonna give you the power that you need to do what it is that I want you to do. And one of the great promises we have this morning is in whatever this world kind of goes to, whatever happens on this planet earth, whatever happens in your life and my life, if we're a follower of Jesus Christ, God says, I'm going to give you the wisdom and the power and the resources to accomplish what I wanted you to do. And so when you study Acts chapter one, the Bible teaches that Jesus goes back to heaven after 40 days. And then for 10 days, the disciples and some others get together and they spend time in prayer. And so here's what happens. Jesus comes 40 days, they see him, all of this. And then he leaves and he says, I want you to pray and I want you to wait. And so for 10 days, they pray and wait. Pentecost means 50. So literally where you get Pentecost in Acts chapter one into Acts chapter two is literally 50 days have passed and the power of God comes. But what are his people doing as they're waiting to move out in what God wants them to do? Listen carefully. They were waiting and they were praying. They were waiting and they were praying for God's spirit to give them the power that they needed to live the life that he wanted them to live and to have the impact that he wanted them to have. And the connection I want us to see as a church, and I pray you pay attention. You know, the tough part of my job is I spend hours preparing something and you feel like it's an hour that it takes me to deliver it. All right, just saying, all right. But the reality is, is if we're not careful, I share all of this and then next Sunday, you've forgotten completely what I said this Sunday, but this is super Sunday where I need you to hear me say, this is the way forward for us. It matters. And so here's the connection that you get in the book of Acts. There is a direct connection in your life, in my life, in every Christ follower's life between power and prayer. You cannot separate that. I mean, I don't care where you go in scripture, listen to me in the New Testament, there's this connection between if God's power is gonna be in your marriage, if God's power is gonna be in your family, if God's power is gonna be in your church, there is this connection. You cannot disconnect it between power and prayer. As a matter of fact, the amount of spiritual power you have in your life is in direct proportion to the amount of time you spend in the presence of God. I like what one writer said, much prayer, much power, little prayer, little power, no prayer, no power. And if you don't ever pray, listen to me carefully as I say this, if you don't ever spend time praying about your life and about your church and about the impact of your life, you are not going to see many miracles in your life. 
You are not going to see supernatural power in your life. You're not going to see supernatural power in your church. You're not going to see supernatural power in your family if you're not praying because prayer is the connection point. It's not all there is to what God wants us to do, but it's the beginning place of what God wants us to do. It's the point where you get power. I'll never forget this. Several years ago, I got up one morning and I went in and I plugged up the iron and I got everything ready. I, I ironed my clothes. Amy won't do it for me, so I do it myself. Amen. I just, sometimes I just like to vent on Sunday mornings, all right, and kind of get it out there. So, and oh, there she is. I'm in trouble. So anyway, um, taking one for the team here, people. So I go in and I plug it up and nobody would take responsibility for this, but I went back in and I got my shirt and I'm sitting there and I'm ironing, and I'm getting ready. But I noticed that the wrinkles weren't coming out. I noticed that I was working. I mean, I was pressing and I was doing all you need to do, but but I was not having any impact in what happened. And finally, I began to realize what the problem was. I looked and somebody who didn't know I had not ironed had came in and unplugged the iron. So I was working. I was doing everything I needed to do. I was following the rules of getting your shirt straightened out. But the reality is there was no impact in what I was doing. And the reason was I had lost the power source that comes with it. And I'm telling you, that's an analogy of life when it comes to scripture. Listen, listen, listen. All of you in this room may be on your way to heaven. You may know with confidence that your last breath here would be your first breath in heaven. And you may be doing all kinds of good things, whatever it may be. But listen to me, if you are not plugged in to prayer and seeking God and asking God to work in your life, here's what's gonna happen. You will do all the right things in life, but there'll be no impact because only God is the one that can truly do a miracle in any circumstance in any situation. And so no matter how many Bible studies you go to, say amen, so you heard that. I don't care how many churches you attend. I don't care how many small groups you're a part of. I don't care how much you're involved in ministry. If you are not plugged into the power source, which is God himself in your life, you are going to be lacking. Even Jesus said, think about this for a minute. Even Jesus said to people that spent three and a half years on this earth with him, at least three years, Jesus looked at them and said, you're going to have to wait if you're going to have supernatural power inside of your life. We know based on scripture where that comes from. It comes by praying. They prayed for 10 days and get this, the more you pray in your life, the more spiritual power you are going to have. And that's why, listen, if we are going to have the impact that God wants us to have as a church in days like this, and make no mistake about it, listen to me, God teaches us that he uses challenging and difficult days to his glory and to his benefit. God does do that. And so if we're going to have the impact he wants us to have, we are going to have to increase the emphasis of prayer inside of our church. Because we are going to need, listen to me carefully, in the next year, five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, however the long, long the Lord tarries, we're going to need a lot of miracles if we want to experience God's best. Guys, I got to tell you, if liberty is going to accomplish what God wants it to accomplish, we're going to need miracles. We're not, it's not just going to be business as usual. It's not just going to be keep the doors open, sing some songs, preach some messages, gather up in little small groups and talk about Jesus. That's not enough. That's not enough. We're going to need God to work and God to move. And if we're going to see that, we're going to have to pray. You know, all of us, I'm confident of this. Anybody that watches the news, and some of y'all quit watching the news because you see it. All of us are challenged by the days that we're seeing in our culture. Can we agree with that? Some of you have quit watching the news. Some of you, you're still watching. It's why you look mad this morning while I'm talking to you. The challenges in our society, think about this, the challenges in our personal lives, no matter where you normally are in your stress level, what's going on in this world has it an in, a, a kind of a, a, an exponential level. And so we all see that there's need for change. Some of you see it in your marriage, some of you see it in your finances, some of you see it in your neighborhood, some of you see it in our city, some of you see it in the nation, but you see it. And I want to remind everybody in this room, listen to me very carefully. And I can say this with confidence. And some of you guys that have been on the journey the longest with us, you need to say amen to your preacher right now. We've had some miracles at Liberty. We've had some financial miracles. I mean, I'm still astounded at what God did in our church and how he's worked. Uh, we've had some personal miracles. We've watched as God's restored relationships, as God's changed lives, as he's moved in very powerful ways. We've seen God do some miracles in marriages and families and all kinds of circumstances. But I want to say this this morning. I'd like to see more of them. I don't want to spend the rest of my life looking to the past of my life. I want something ahead in my life where I can say God continues to work and God continues to move. Some of you are here this morning and you know you need a miracle. Some of you need a miracle in your attitude. Come on now. And you know what's funny about that? The person that needs that didn't say amen, but the person that knows them did. Come on now, right? I mean, just think about it, okay? But you think about that for a minute. You need, you need a, a miracle in your attitude, a miracle in your perspective, a miracle in your finance, a miracle in your, in your, in, in your neighborhood, whatever it may be. 
And if you want to see more miracles, there's only one way we're going to get it. Listen to me very carefully. That is supernatural power. And where do you get that from? You've got to get plugged in. You've got to make sure that the Holy Spirit is working and moving in your life. Notice what the Bible says in verse 43 of Acts chapter 2. Uh, verse 43 of Acts chapter 2. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. Isn't that where you want to live? I mean, God begins to move. He begins to create his church. He begins to save people. Lives begin to get changed. He's instituting the church for which he died for. That's what's going on in Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2. And when you get to verse, right there in that verse 43, the Bible says everyone kept feeling this sense of awe. And can I tell you something? That is where God wants his church. God doesn't want to sit in heaven and say, look what you did. God wants you to see what he did. And that's what God's calling us to, the work that only he can do. And it says that many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. See, the problem today is, listen to me, and I say this in love and compassion, but, but in a passion to see God change it, that power is missing in most churches. A lot of churches talk about God. Listen to me. This is what I grew up in. But they don't see a lot of lives changed. They don't see the miracles. And by the way, jot this down. It's a great verse in your Bible. You ought to read it. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 20. You ought to read the context. I don't have time to take you through it. But you ought to read the context of 1 Corinthians chapter 4 when Paul's talking to the Corinthians there. But here's what he says in verse 20. Listen to this. For the kingdom of God is not in words. The kingdom of God is, is not tied up and we gather together and we talk about it. We gather together and we open a text and we teach it. The kingdom of God's not tied up in those things. But what does the Bible say it's tied up in? But in power. See, God wants us to know him, but he wants us to know him so we can experience him. It's not a know about. It's about, listen, God works in you so that he can work through you. It's something that changes you. It gives you the power to be the person that God wants you to be. It's an empowered life. And one thing I want to see happen this year, listen to me, is more emphasis on prayer because I want to see more power in and around us as a church, liberty. And so this week, here's what we're going to do. Bible 101 kicks back off. And I didn't have time to do everything I want to do this morning and this, so we're just going to break it up. So we're going to kick off with communion in Bible 101 this Wednesday night. And one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to bring some specific prayer requests that I'm going to ask you to begin to join in with me to pray every single day for our church. Now listen to me. I'm grateful for prayer service. Everybody, we need more prayer service, more prayer service. And that's great. But guys, what we need is more praying people. We, we got to quit thinking that God only works in a service time, in a gathering time of a bunch of people. And I'm grateful for those times. Praise God for that. But we don't need people at Liberty praying weekly. We need people at Liberty praying daily if we're going to see God move and God works. So I want to put into your hands, and for those of you that miss joining us online for Bible 101 or you miss being in the auditorium for Bible 101, uh, you, I'm going to email those out at the end of the week. I'm not going to give them out to Wednesday night, but then I'll email them out Thursday or Friday, and the whole church can have them. But we're going to be asking you to pray daily. And, and I'm telling you, listen, if we will do it, we we will see God move. See, if we will connect more with God in prayer, listen to this. If we'll connect more with God in prayer and disconnect from the world around us, come away from your FaceTime every once in a while. Come away from, listen to me, your social media. Come away um, from your television and your programs and all that kind of stuff and connect with God. If we will do that, we will have a powerful church that will do things beyond our ability. And that's where God wants to work. See, God doesn't want the community going, oh, look what Chris Dixon did. God doesn't want the community going, oh, look what those volunteers did. God wants this community saying, oh, look what God did, what only God could do. And the beginning point of that is prayer. And that's what I desire. That's what you desire. And this is the beginning. Secondly, here's the second part. Y'all got to listen faster, okay, because I got four of these, so come on. And y'all need to smile at me, all right? Because if you don't, I'm going to hit you in point number three, and you're going to wish you would have smiled. Number two, liberty needs to learn and live out the truth of God's word in love. Guys, the days ahead is this. Listen to me. We, you know, I'm hearing so much from the church. Truth, truth, truth. And I believe in truth. And if you've been in this church very long, you know I believe in truth. But you better make sure you never separate truth and love. And what the world's going to use against the church of Jesus Christ in the days ahead, you better listen to this pastor. What the world is going to use against us in the days ahead is he's going to use, uh, what, what it's going to use is the fact that you and I have a tendency to speak truth from Southern heritage background not Southern Heritage Barbecue Place for you guys that are paying attention. From our Southern Heritage, rather from a biblical place of grace and mercy and love and sharing truth for the purpose of change. Not sharing truth for the sake of sharing truth, but sharing truth for the sake of saving lives. And there is a difference. See, if I share truth because I want to see your life changed and saved, then there's compassion in me about you as an individual. If I share truth for the sake of getting truth out, I don't care about you. I just want my truth out. And that's the problem the world's got. Let's make sure the church doesn't have the same problem the world's got. That we're so bent on that that we don't have compassion in what we do. Now, I want to be very clear this morning. We don't offer self-help at liberty. Somebody say amen, help preacher out. 
We offer the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, because it's God's word that changes you. Jesus himself said it's the truth that sets you free. And listen to me, until you know the truth about you and the truth about God and the truth about life and the truth about death and the truth about what matters in life, until you know the truth in every area, the Bible says you're going to be enslaved. You'll be a slave to the culture, a slave to the expectation of others, a slave to the expectation of yourself. You'll be a slave to your habits, to your addictions, to all kinds of things, but it's the truth that sets us free. And in Acts, the church offered the truth of God. Listen to me. This is what we need to understand, which can't be offered anywhere else. That's what the Bible would say to us. It's a transforming truth. Listen to this. Make sure you hear me say this this morning. No other organization, no other group of people has the truth that says your past can be forgiven. You can have a purpose for living. Your last breath here can be your first breath in heaven. No matter where you've been, God can change you, raise you from the ashes, and use your life to his glory. Nobody else has that spectacular story which is the story of the gospel. Where else are you going to get that? And I'm here to tell you this morning, nowhere, no other message changes lives like the good news. And and listen, we've got a church full of people that can give testimony to that. Notice the results when you teach the good news. Basically, if you study the book of Acts in Acts chapter 2, Peter preaches a message. He preaches the gospel. Notice the results in verse 41 and 42 of chapter 2. So then those who had received his word were baptized. They heard this great message And that day, listen, there were added about 3,000 souls. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. If you study this, Peter's message in Acts chapter 2, verse 22 through 40 is the same message we're sharing today. He may have said it in different ways, but it's the same gospel message. And the point is, listen to me, and I want to make sure you understand this. The church of Jesus Christ is based on the Bible. It's based on truth. It's not based on our opinions. So when you see denominations saying, well, I think this is true and I think this is not. No, the church is based on the word of God. It's not based on popular opinion. It's not changing with psychology. It's based on what God says. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. That's why the church had power. I want you to jot down James chapter 1, verse 22 through 25. Listen to these words and make sure you don't fall into the negative of this category. The Bible says this, everybody say amen, so know you're listening. But prove yourselves to be doers of the word. You know, the Bible doesn't even say prove yourself to be studiers of the word for the purpose of studying. But every time when the Bible speaks of studying, it speaks to producing. I study, listen to me, I study the word of God so the word of God can study me. It's producing something. So he says this, but prove yourselves to be doers of the word and not just hearers who deceive themselves. For if anyone's a hearer of the word, you come on Sunday morning, but you don't do what it says. Think about that for just a minute. He's like a man who looks at his natural face in the mirror. For once he's looked at himself and gone away, he's immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But the one who has looked intently at the perfect law, the law of freedom, and has continued, and it's God's word, God's truth, not having become a forgetful here, but an active doer, this person will be blessed in what he does. Now, we did that this morning. Every one of you got up, you looked in the mirror, and you didn't look in the mirror and go, man, I look rough. It's going to be an embarrassing day. That's not, nobody did that in this room right? Even if you guys did that, your wife would be like, go right back in there and you do something about that. Come on, right? So what happens? I look and it makes a change. And that's what this is about. Listen to me very carefully. Make sure the word of God is changing you. And then if the word of God is changing you, God will use your life to produce change in others. Because listen to me very carefully. While the world may never look in the Bible, they will constantly look at you. While the world may never reflect themselves in the word of God, they will reflect themselves in you because they got to go to work with you. They got to live next door to you. They got to interact with you at the grocery store. And so if you will live the life that God's calling you to live, you begin to produce what God wants you to produce. Jot down Hebrews 5, 14. This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. But solid food is for the mature. I always hear this. We need to go deeper. We need to go deeper. But listen to what the Bible says deeper is. The Bible says, who because of practice, what is he saying? Deeper is not what I know. Deeper is what I do. If you want to live a deep life in God, just quit talking and start doing, and you'll be amazed how quickly your marriage will get deeper, your attitude will get deeper, your life will get deeper in what God wants you to be. Because of practice, have their senses trained to distinguish between good and evil. This is why we focus in this ministry to teach you God's word and help you to apply it to your life. Let me just show you real quick on Super Sunday how how we function at this church. Uh, Sunday morning is targeted to make the Bible practical to your life. 
I mean, every week when I come in here, I'm not just thinking about teaching you a text. I'm thinking about how can you take this text and get it out in your daily life. And so that's the focal point of what we do on Sunday morning. Then we move to Bible 101. The reason we do Bible 101, Liberty, is because what we want to do, we want to get you in the doctrines of the faith, the foundations of the faith. And I make no bones about it. Where you get those things at Liberty, you get them in Bible 101. As we open up this book and we verse by verse it, we deal with the difficult topics, the difficult things, and we show you, hey, this is who God's calling us to be. This is what God is calling us to know. Then we offer our life groups. And our life groups offer twofold. They want to train you, but they also want to connect you, bring you into fellowship and kind of make sure that you're connecting your lives with other believers who can uh, challenge you and speak to you and encourage you and all of those kinds of things. And then listen, we have D groups. And by the way, I thought I would use this morning. Some of you D group leaders who quit leading, you need to get back to leading because this world desperately needs people like you who understand doctrine, understand truth, and you need to get that into these younger Christians. And then we offer the next class. I, I, I make no bones about it. Somebody said to me, Pastor Chris, you can only teach one thing to Christ followers. You can only teach one thing. I mean, listen, you can't teach them every single doctrine. You can't teach them all these things. You can only teach them one thing. What are you going to give them? I'm going to teach them to walk with God because if they'll walk with God, God will walk them where they need to go. And so that's the focal point of what I want to do. And that's what we do in the next class. We teach you to walk with God, hear God's voice, study God's word. We do all this so that, listen to me very carefully, you can learn, say amen. But even more importantly, based upon scripture, we do it so you can live. You know what the worst thing you could ever do for your children? Come in close and hear this. Let me tell you the worst thing you'll ever do for the next generation. Know the word of God, but not live the word of God. You'll wreck your children's lives. You'll wreck your neighbor's lives. And you'll wreck everybody around you. Because you'll be great at spouting off but you'll be horrible at demonstrating. And you know what the world needs? The world needs a demonstration. That's why Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. What he was saying was, I came to teach you truth, but I came to model it and show it. And listen to me, you and I are on this earth today as Christ followers, not to just speak the truth, but to model the truth and show the truth. Because again, while the world may never look in the reflection of the Bible, they will look into the reflection of you. And that may be the only Bible anyone ever reads. And I just said, amen, pastor, preach, lay it out there and let them know. And so... That's what the Word of God teaches us. And so look, number three, all right? And I told you how to smile earlier, you'd be in trouble, and some of you didn't, so here you go. Liberty needs to be a people of joyful worship. You know, in difficult days like this, the church is kind of gets rattled sometimes. Well, it can't be a celebration all the time and all these kind of things. Well, the Bible says rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice and so the Bible does teach us this is how we ought to be. See, worship is a celebration. It's a festival, not a funeral. It's a party for the kingdom of God. I love what one author said, that there's two reasons why believers don't become Christians. One, they've never met a Christian. Two, they have met a Christian. Come on now, I'm just saying. And I didn't say that. I read that. So I just, there you go. All right. Listen, some Christians, and I say this in love, you guys online, listen to me very carefully. And look, don't you just think about how you, look, think about your social media. Think about every area of your life. Some Christians are so negative and so legalistic and so judgmental. No wonder we got the mess that we got. And I don't know about you, but I want to be around joyful people. I don't want to be around critical negative people. And by the way, don't do this. But I think if I said, raise your hand, if you want to be around critical negative people, nobody would raise their hand. And if they did, I can tell you what kind of people they are. I'm just saying. Now, look, don't get mad at me. I'm just, just helping you out here. Look at the church at its best. Verse 46 of Acts chapter 2. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple. They had one purpose, one mind, one drive. In verse 47, it says this, praising God and having favor. Notice that. You know, a lot of times we talk about how rejected Christians are to the world, and it is true. But listen to me. Can I tell you, even as the world rejects us, there are those that God is drawing out to accept us. Did y'all hear that? So there are people to have favor with. And God, listen to me, you realize this morning, look, you, God gave you emotions to express yourself. The only reason you have emotions is because, listen, God has emotions and you're created in his image. Uh, when you read your Bible, you see the joy of God, but you see the sadness of God. You see the anger of God, but you see the celebration of God. You have all these emotions because you were created in God's image and you were wired for worship. And I've taught you since I've been your pastor. Listen to me carefully. If you don't worship God, you will find something to worship. Didn't even get an amen right there. <laughs> You'll find sports to worship. And you go to that altar every Saturday and every Sunday. You'll find a job to worship, money to worship. Some of y'all worship the Georgia Bulldogs. You've got to find something to worship. In fact, let me say this. Find the logic in this for me. You know, during COVID, people were fighting to get the NCAA back on the field. 
I mean, they, 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 was, they were warring. We want, we want sports. We want sports. We need sports in our society. And listen, that goes at all levels. I mean, there were people, you know, it's interesting. When we were in the shutdown, we came out two weeks after the shutdown. We were in Jacksonville, Florida for Amy's uh, radiation. And I went and the ball fields in Jacksonville, Florida were packed with elementary students playing baseball and having fun with their families and all those kinds of things. Now tell me the logic that it's okay for you to go to a game or a concert and yell your head off and throw your hands up and hoot and holler and act like a fool and nobody thinks that's weird because I'm just a fan and I just love sports. But if I come to church and show any kind of emotion or if I live with a celebration of who God is and what he does, tell me the logic that I'm allowed to get emotional about everything else except for the most important thing in life. I can get emotional about a game. I can get emotional about my favorite band and all these things coming to town and all that, but I can't get excited about the fact that my past is forgiven. I've got a purpose for living. I've got a home in heaven. I can't get emotional about that. Give me a break. That makes no sense to me. And I think when you read the early church, listen to me, they had challenges, but they had fun. And that's what the Bible's telling us right here. As a matter of fact, I love what Peter teaches here. Notice Acts 2 and verse 28. In Acts 2 and verse 28, Peter's teaching, all right, the gospel. And in Acts 2, 28, he says this. He quotes David. He says, you have made known to me the ways of life. And that's what a Christ follower can say. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. That's where lasting joy comes from. Knowing the path that leads to life, knowing the purpose in life, and feeling God's presence. God is with me. And guys, I got to tell you, if all you do is focus on the doom and gloom of the world, you will be depressed, you will be discouraged, and you will be overwhelmed. But the Bible says that you have a hope that the rest of this world doesn't have. And because you know that hope, you ought to share that hope with joy because it is the hope of the world. As a matter of fact, in Acts 2, 26, more of his sermons, notice what he says. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue was overjoyed. Moreover, my flesh also will live in hope. Now, listen to me carefully because i got a question for you. Do you think if everybody in our church lived like this, our hearts were glad, our words were joyful, we lived in hope, would that attract the rest of the world? You better believe it. You wouldn't even have to advertise. You wouldn't even have to market. But what happens is, listen to me, and I say this because I have to watch myself, but what happens is if we're negative and we're angry, listen, it is better not to let people know you're a Christ if you're going to live like that because you're a bad representation. My name's Chris. I'm your friend. Y'all are like, you were funny before, but I'm not enjoying this now. See, he's saying if my heart is glad and my words are joy, and if I live in hope, that's going to attract people. And I say this with great compassion. We've been through some of the most difficult days our generation's ever known. I've told you guys all through this, whatever the, the stress level of life normally is, it's exponentially worse because of what we're seeing in our culture and what's going on in our society. And so I say it with great compassion, but some of you have lost your joy and you better get it back. Some of you have lost your joy and you better get it back. You need to pray like David, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. That, that's where it's got to take us. That's where we've got to go because our attitude and our temperament and our words and our social media, listen to me, speaks to a lost, dying world. And we need to make sure that it speaks that which draws rather than repels. That leads me to the last element. Some of you are thinking, thank God. The last element says liberty needs to live magnanimous lives. I love that word. We need to live magnanimous lives. If you've been around our church for very long, I did a whole series a whole series 24 months ago, when we got ready in the last 24 months, but when we got ready to move into the new decade, the beginning of 2020, uh, I did a whole series on magnanimous. Little did I know, somebody help me in Jesus' name, right? I talked about magnanimous, having no idea what was ahead of us. Magnanimous means this, we'll put it on the screen. The basic definition is showing or suggesting a courageous spirit, showing or suggesting a generosity of mind. Whenever you see anima or animus or simple formation of that word, it's an indicator that something is alive, it's lively, it's spirited. Something animated is what? Full of life. The Latin animus means soul or spirit. And so in magnanimous, that animus is joined to a Latin magnus, meaning great. So what it means is greatness of spirit. Jot that down. Now, I don't care who you are in this room. I don't care what you think your personality is. I don't care what you kind of, well, Chris, you're just this and I'm this and all that. No, 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 no. Listen, understand the Bible calls us to a greatness of spirit. The adjectives for magnanimous is this, giving, generous, or kind. And Christ, Father, and Acts, are you listening to me? Go read the book. They were famous for their generosity. They took care of each other. They took care of the poor. They helped each other. They literally shared everything. Here's what the Bible says about the first church. Verse 44, notice it. And all the believers were together and had all things in common. It just means they shared and cared. 
And they would sell their property and possessions and share them with all to the extent that anyone had need. And that drives me crazy when I read commentaries and listen to people debate these verses because they come back and they say, well, it didn't really mean this. It didn't really mean that. Can we stop trying to explain everything and just get to the heart of what it's saying? What it's saying is they deeply cared for one another and they wanted to make sure they were helping one another in this challenging life. They simply met each other's needs. Verse 46, day by day, continuing with one mind, the temple, breaking bread from house to house. They were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. They were praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. That's an amazing passage of Scripture. Do you see how far the 21st century church has moved from the 1st century church? And this was deep days of persecution. Totally voluntary is how they lived. Generous and sacrificial. They shared everything, not just money, but it's just you got a need. I'm going to try to feel and meet that need. I love what it says in verse 46, breaking bread. They, 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 they shared meals. I like that one. Y'all with me? Come on now. I like that one. With great joy and generosity. Though, depending on your translation, it speaks of gladness. It's gladness you see around the church of Jesus Christ. It speaks of joy. It speaks of sincerity. It speaks of generosity. Get this, this is a biblical principle all through the New Testament. The Son of God walked on this earth and he taught this principle. If you want joy, you gotta have generosity and you can't separate the two. If you want joy, you gotta have generosity and you can't separate the two. You will never really have lasting joy. I'm not saying you can't have joy without being generous, but it won't be lasting joy. You cannot have lasting joy without generosity. Get in a marriage and focus on self and see how long joy lasts. <laughs> Come on now. I just wanna pause for effect. Is that all right with you guys? But get in a marriage where there's generosity coming from both sides, and let me tell you what you will have. You'll have a whole lot of joy in that relationship. Because the more generous you are, the more joyful you are, the more joy you have, the more it makes you want to be generous because generous churches are joyful. And I'm grateful, listen to me, I'm grateful for the generosity of our church. You know, every time you walk on this property, and I hope you guys pay attention, especially those visiting with us or maybe newer to Liberty, every time you walk on this property, you need to look at this building and you need to remind yourself that this building represents people that could have went on a vacation, could have bought the laptop, could have maybe done the addition on the house, maybe could have done the renovation, but instead in generosity because they loved you and cared about you, they poured that into the kingdom of God so the kingdom of God could be built so your life could be touched. What better generosity that produces joy than to do something like that with your one and only life, which just brings factual evidence to what I've already said, and that is the power of God is not tied into words. The power of God is tied into actions actions. You can know it all, but if you don't ever act on what you know, you'll never experience that which you already know. And so in the future, I want to say to everybody in this room, we are going to continue. We need to continue to be the most generous church we can possibly be. We got to continue to help those in need in our community. We got to continue to serve and risk it all. We've got to continue to go after it and pursue all these different kinds of things because of generosity. And so here's my question. Think about this. Think about this for just a minute and I'll be done. Do you think if we went back to the original New Testament Christianity, not the fake stuff, not I go to church, not, yeah, I'm a Christ follower, not all that kind of stuff, but I'm talking about the kind of church that has supernatural power because they pray. The kind of church that sees miracles happen, things that only God can do because we're asking God to do them. And everybody's giving and everybody's serving and everybody's magnanimous. It's just the attitude, this giving spirit. And we offer these life-changing truths to show people that we've blown in the past and we've messed up, but God forgave us and gave us grace and we trust in him and you can do the same. And God can help you with your habits and your hurts and your hangups. And we give them the true gospel. And we celebrate what God is doing. We have a good time in this one and only life that we got. Because while some of you are waiting to get out of this, we don't know when we're going to get out of this. So this is life. We better enjoy where we are. We make these sacrifices. Do you think that we might just reach more people for Jesus? That's the kind of church that we were. And I would say to you without a doubt, I am confident that based on the power of God and the spirit of God and the will of God and the desire of God, that we can do more in the next 10 years than we've done in the last 15 years combined. I mean, just blow it away. I really believe that with all of my heart. But we've got to have that kind of commitment, a magnanimous life for Christ. And I want you to notice the results. You know what the results of all this is? Rapid, multiplying, fast, exponential growth. When you do these things, it's automatic. Acts 2, 47, praising God, having favor with all the people, and the Lord was adding to the number day by day those that were being saved. See, the lifestyle of these Christ followers impacted the life of those who did not know Christ. And there it is. That's our mission. That's our goal. That's our pursuit. 
And you know what happens to us so often in life? We get so consumed with our own life and our own desires and our own dreams and our own ambitions that we can't step aside and see that God wants to do something with this one and only life, with the money that we have and the places that we work and the people that we know, and we miss out. You know, I was thinking, one of my favorite things about liberty, say amen so know you're with me. Even if I ticked you off, you ought to still listen to what I'm saying. One of the things I love about liberty is that we worship in an old grocery store. I love that about our church. I love that this used to be a grocery store. Because you know what a grocery store represents? A grocery store represents where the needs of the community get, get met. I mean, think about it. Where, where, do you get, where do you get food to sustain life, right? If you're like me and you don't know how to farm and raise animals, right, you go to the grocery store and you get what you need to sustain your life. So it really becomes the resource of sustainability for life. And I love that. But you know what's sad about a grocery store? What's sad about a grocery store is when a grocery store does not have the means to offer what's needed for the sustainability of life. And we got to experience that this past year, right? I mean, y'all remember going to the grocery store? I can remember one day going to the grocery store and, and I had a list of things we needed. I mean, we needed them. And so I go to Walmart. Walmart didn't have it because all y'all hoarded it up. It's in your garages and everywhere else. <laughs> and I was late to the game, right? And so you hoard all that up. So I go and it's not there. So I go to Walmart. It's not there. I go to Kroger. It's not there. And I thought, surely East Dublin doesn't have enough people to run out of it. So let's go over there. Just kidding. Because there's a lot of East Dublin people here. So I did. I went over to East Dublin and I started hitting their grocery stores, right? And I, I found some of the things I needed, but I couldn't find everything I needed. And it's so frustrating. And you know how that is. But I mean, we watched as the shelves got cleared. So here we were in need. We had something we needed. But when we went, we couldn't get what it was that we needed. And that's a difficult place to live. I'm so grateful. I had a friend that uh, was out of town. They called me and said, do you need these things? And they said, man, I found it. I'm going to bring it to you. And they provided it for me. And what I want to say to you guys is just as a grocery store is, listen, there to provide what is needed for, the, for bread and for sustenance, the Bible teaches that the church of Jesus Christ is there for the bread of life. Not for the bread for life, but the bread of life. And if we don't walk with God and know God and live out this thing that we teach, one of the most frustrating things to me in the world is Christ followers who know so much and do so little. Know so much, do so little. And I'm here to tell you this morning, listen to me, what I love about being a grocery store, and I thank God for those that grew up here and you drive here and everything, you think, man, this used to be a Kroger, this used to be a Kroger. Can I tell you something? It's something that's greater than a Kroger now. And we've got to know that when people come on this property, that they're going to get the bread of life. We've got to know that when we send you out into the school system, we've got to know that when we send you out into the workforce and out into your neighbors and out into those around you, we've got to know that we are sending out the sustenance of life, that that's what we are, that that's what we represent. And for everybody that gets frustrated with political parties and everybody that gets frustrated with our nation and where it's going, I want to remind you that God never said the hope of the world was in a nation. God never said the hope of the world was in a political party. God never said that the hope of the world was in humanity. The hope of the world is Jesus Christ. That's what we've got. Oh, God, help us to go give it out in the way that God designed for us to give it out. And we will have the impact that God desires for us to have. And so, Father, may we be your church, ready and willing to serve in the good days and in the challenging days. May we know, oh God, write it in our hearts this morning. May all of us at Liberty know the way forward. This is the beginning. May we walk in it to your glory and to your fame. In Jesus' name, amen. Heads bowed, eyes closed, nobody looking around. Maybe you're here this morning. And I want you to listen to me very carefully. Maybe you're here this morning and you've never placed your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to listen to me carefully because I just want to tell you what the Bible teaches because I told you the church is built upon the Bible. So what does the Bible teach? The Bible teaches that every man, woman, boy, and girl that will ever walk the face of this earth has sinned. Now, you know, often we say, well, I'm not a bad sinner. We kind of argue about sin. But the bottom line is the Bible says that we've sinned. And here's what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that the wages of sin is death. Now, death represents separation from God. It represents an eternity apart from God because we've sinned. We've sinned against God. But let me give you the good news of what the Bible teaches. Now, I'm going to tell you Romans chapter 6 and verse 23 says, The wages of sin is death. There's punishment for sin. That's why God gave us this message. It's why he sent his son because there is punishment for sin. That's why Christ came. That's why Christ died. If God was just going to be passive about sin, why do we get Jesus? Why do we get the cross? Why do we get the crucifixion, the punishment that, that went upon the life of Jesus? Because the Bible says that you and I have sinned. The wages of that sin is death. But the gift of God, what God gave to you is his son, Jesus Christ, who came to this earth and never sinned. And yet he took the wrath, the penalty, the punishment for your sins, for my sins, so that we'd never have to. The Bible teaches that anyone that calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You're here this morning and you sense 
God's saying to you, you need to come to me. You need to ask me for forgiveness. You sense God speaking to you. You sense God drawing you. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Would you cry out to God this morning right where you are in your own heart, in your own life, out to God, God, I know I'm a sinner. There's no arguing that. There's no debating that. I know I'm a sinner. This morning, I'm asking you to forgive me of my sins. God, today, I want to put my faith in Jesus Christ and that he took the penalty and the punishment for my sins so that I never have to. God, today I want to trust my eternity, but I want to trust my today and my tomorrows to Him to allow Him to lead and guide and direct my life. Then would you say to God this morning, listen to me carefully, God, thank you for hearing me because there it is. The Bible's so clear, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so you got to believe. You got to trust. God, thank you for hearing me. I believe you heard me. I believe what Christ did for me. Thank you for hearing me. God, beginning today, lead and guide and direct my life in Jesus' name. Amen. Heads bowed, eyes closed. If you're here this morning, if you made that decision in the auditorium, would you just slip your hand up, hold up really high? Nobody's coming to you. You're going to embarrass you. God bless you. I, I see some of you guys. Hey, those of you that made that decision, would you look at me? Now, this is really important. Those of you online, look, I want to make sure you understand this. I, I'll be the first one to say this. Sometimes in these moments, it's, it's hard to get a full understanding. And maybe you've got questions, and I want to make sure that I answer those questions and we can respond to that. So I put together a resource that's going to help you understand the decision that you made. And here's all you got to do on the screen. You're going to notice if you're in the auditorium, you can look at the screen online. It should be in front of you. You're going to notice a phone number. And all you got to do is text the word trust. And if you'll do that right now, you're immediately going to hear from me. And here's what's going to happen. We're, we're going to connect and I'm going to get that resource into your hands this week. And it's going to help you to kind of understand some things. It may even raise some questions, but it'll put us in, in touch with one another where we can make sure kind of where your life goes from here. So make sure right now you just text that number, the word trust, you'll meet here back. If you're in the auditorium, I've got the resource right here. If you look at me, there's going to be some ladies and gentlemen right here with masks, the social distance. You can actually come to them this morning. And you can simply say, hey, I made that decision. They'll give you the resource. You can take it with you. But it's going to help kind of move you through. Where does my life go from here? And what does all this, this mean? And that's where we want to go. It's helping make sure you understand that. So make sure you let us know you made that decision. Whether in the building or online, those are ways you can let us know. You'll notice an email address. If email works better for you, you can take that. But make sure you let us know that you made that decision. Then I want to say this to Christ followers. There may be some of you here and you're like, man, I really desire to pray. I really desire to become what God wants me to be. I don't know how I would challenge you. Listen, you can do the same thing. You can text the word trust when we contact you. You can let them know, hey, I'm already a Christian, but I really want to learn how to pray, how to read my Bible. That's what this resource does, helps you through those kind of things. So we'll get that in your hand. You could come to these guys at the close of service and say, I really want to learn to develop this relationship that I have with God. So all you got to do is go to them. They'll help you through that process. But that's what we're about. We've even got life groups that go on Sunday morning you can slip into that teaches you how to walk with God, how to spend time with God so that God can develop and bring your life to the places that he desires for it to be. But I want to challenge everybody in this room, and I'm really listening to me, you Christ followers. I really want to challenge you, and I've said it throughout this kind of beginning of 2021. This needs to be your year. This needs to be your year where you say, I'm going to develop. I'm going to grow. I listen, you need to take in information. That's part of growing. But you need to flesh out information. That's where you really begin to grow. We want to help you. That's what we're here for. It's a process that we want to take you through. That's something we're willing to sign up for. And so you can begin that journey. So Father, we thank you for this time together this morning. And Lord, I'm believing that you are going to use your church in these days. You got a plan. And God, you're working your plan. And God, you have the power to change lives. And you are going to do that. And Lord, what I want to do is get in on it. That's what I want for this church. And so, God, may you lead us, may you guide us, may you direct us. Oh, God, help us not to be a place that gathers and discusses. Help us to be a place that gathers, discusses, but then goes out and delivers on the life that you're calling us to live. We can't do it without you. We won't do it without your power. So, oh God, may you provide it for our lives as we seek your face. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Hey, so glad you guys were here this morning. Really important morning for us at Liberty. So I'm glad you guys were here. Hey, you don't want to miss next Sunday. It's going to be awesome around this place. So you guys are dismissed. Hope to see you Wednesday night for Bible 101.